Greetings, it is I, Tantus Narodan Jacobin, Lord and Emperor of the Jacobin Empire, and welcome. It is time to continue my discussion on Spelljammer back from AD&D. So I, of course, have been going over the campaign settings that many of which have been introduced in Dungeon in the original Advanced Dungeon and Dragons, but I have been, of course, starting with Spelljammer, D&D Adventures in Space. So let's continue from where we left off. We had finished up talking about some of the races and creatures that you can find in space, and that's where I'm going to expand upon now. I'm going to talk about a whole bunch of more of the different various races and monsters that will be important for you to know about when journeying into Spelljammer. There's, of course, a whole list of a lot of unusual, strange, and unique monsters which appear in Spelljammer, which I'm not going to dive into the entire depths of. I'm going to dive into the ones that are probably ones you're going to encounter more commonly. Let's start with Beholderkin, because Beholderkin are strange creatures that technically count as family to the Beholders, and oftentimes are of course bred by their hive mothers, but they form as lesser kin that are workers upon various ships and colonies of Beholders. They are bred for each specific purposes, and do them quite well, whether they are soldiers, assistant, watchers, those sort of things, various jobs that they're given. Each Beholderkin has that one job or a few jobs that it does, and it does them well. And most of them have a very similar appearance of a kind of Orbis creature, or at least has the idea of this central eye to it. Though each of them appears in varyingly different forms. Let's move on, though, from the Beholderkin, because you're probably not going to encounter them unless you're battling with Beholder ships or getting into an area that their Beholders are having a massive civil war type battle. Let's talk about Hadoze. They appear as bipedal ape men. The only main difference between them is in between their arms and their legs are flaps of skin, which if they stretch out, they can use to glide. Now granted, this is like a, it's not really flying, it's gliding down from heights and used normally in treetop areas, which they would originally have come from in their own natural habitats. Now, the Hodose actually function as mercenary warriors when it comes out, or adventurers exploring the universe. Many of them find themselves enjoying going out into space. They are well-trained, natural-born melee fighters and specialize in melee weapons incredibly. They are excellent battlers. Their force most coveted positions are port board elven ships, which they are often actually hired on for. The Hidoze themselves travel out into the world at a younger age and go out and adventure for many years, and when they're reaching their older age is when they return home to start families and spread the next generation, so they spend many years out and exploring. The fact is, they do have this relationship with the elves that, time, that goes back to the Unhuman Wars. They originally were lumped together with all the other kind of savage races which were eliminated during the Unhuman Wars, but they banded together and allied with the elves in the war and it was the result of this that the elves have gained some kind of respect for them not not a respect on an equal level but enough respect that they see them as valued assets to have aboard ships and so you will oftentimes see hidoze aboard elven ships <clears throat> now hidoze as i said really enjoy these jobs because they are fairly well respected as many races would probably respect them as equal as equal as the elves do, if not less, and they are very well paid for their jobs aboard elven ships. And of course, Hidoze are not only great warriors, they are great deck men and, and great just general rigging men too. They can climb very well into the, tr into the tops of riggings if they need to. Now, Hidoze themselves, they like warm areas since they come from more of a jungle area, but they can dress well for cold areas, and because of their way that they can go through pretty much eating anything that a normal person eats, and even some stuff like bugs and grubs that normal people wouldn't eat, they actually have a very wide diet that makes them very easy to take care of in a group. So, hence, they are actually looked at as being valuable members of crew. Now let's mention something that's unusual, but I like to talk about because I find them funny and entertaining, the giant space hamster. We can thank Kryn, the gnomes of the Kryn space for breeding the giant space hamster. It is not natural. They have bred it. So those tinker gnomes decided to breed gigantic bear slash horse sized hamsters to have around. They function as pets, mounts, and in many situations, food. They have been discovered to be actually quite tasty. So you could actually farm giant space hamsters. The giant space hamster itself is effectively useless and not much of a threat on its own. It's the breeding. The breeding that the gnomes have done. 
there is a vast variety of giant space hamster breeds that are out there, some of which can actually be very dangerous and a threat to people when they would meet them. Some breathe fire, some have multiple heads, some regenerate. Some are even more gigantic the size of something like a Tyrannosaurus Rex. It goes on what the gnomes have decided to breed for these strange creature and coming up with new varieties of giant space hamster, but there you go. Now, another creature I did want to man mention, not because I find it entertaining, but because it is very dangerous and it should be talked about, the Space Mimic! There are mimics in space. They appear oftentimes as debris left over from other ships. They are kind of mean because not only can they survive in the lack of air of space, they have illusion spells, which a normal mimic would not have, meaning they could use illusions, not only their ability to disguise as things, but illusions to trick you in order to eat people. Yes, Space Mimics. They suck. They exist. Let's mention the Pirates of Gith. Now, when the Githrai, or well, when the ancestor race that become the Githrai, the Pirates of Gith, and the Gith Yankee escaped from their the controllers that they had, some of them didn't flee into the astral plane. Some of them fleed into space, led by this this legendary member of them, Gith. So they became the Pirates of Gith. They became effectively a pirate culture. So they are, of course, related to the Githrai and the Gith Yankee, but they have had generations of breeding differently. It's the same way of their, you know, those other two races are technically related but hate each other. The Pirates of Gith, though, don't really get connections to them because the other two are more planar and this is more space-based. Now, they have an entire culture based around space travel. It's all about that. And a piracy, for one thing. They're a culture of pirates. They're all about the ship, pirating, stealing things. And of course, though, they are carnivorous. So they are constantly looking for more supplies. And they have been known for cannibalism with their own kind if they get into fights with them. So they are a very fearsome group that exists out there that you might want to look out. And they are probably the primary space pirate group you might encounter. Now let's talk about the Rastipedes. Rastipedes are, are insect-like creatures. From the waist down, they appear as like just a eight-legged insect creature, but they have a kind of torso and two hands up above there. So they are kind of like a strange insect-like centaur. They are incredibly peaceful. And the advantage that they have is that they get do get spellcasters and their spellcasters don't seem to get that powerful. But when they use a spell jamming helm, they are incredibly efficient at it. Being as powerful as spellcaster, multiple times higher in level at, at using a, a spell jammer helm. So they are incredibly efficient helms, putting them in a quite advantageous situation. They function as actually a group of traders. They love to trade and do that and, and do business deals. This actually puts them in the position that they're oftentimes used by the arcane, functioning as many of their, as their middlemen. So if you're looking for a middleman of the arcane, a rastipede might be what you're going to be finding. Now let's talk about the Grauman. The Grauman are a race of gorilla-like creatures that have favor kind of short sleeved kimonos that they wear for clothing. They love martial arts and wrestling and they're all, their society is based around this family unit that often make the times these families build up into clans. Clans are oftentimes led over by a director, which is a older female that leads over all of them. Now, Grauman do travel out into space and they do get some of their own ships. Traditionally, they purchase ships though, which they have like striking architecture to it and lots of bright colors. They have this entire kind of way of designing things or of decorating ships that makes them stand out a lot more from other races. Now, the final one I want to talk about today is the Rhaegar. The Rhaegar are a race of, a legendary race of androgynous humanoids. So they very much look the same male and female, <laughs> you know, beautiful men, handsome women, that sort of thing. But they are known as legendary artists and legendary craftsmen. There are many legends that say that the Rhaegar were the ones that taught various races their artistic abilities or their craftsman abilities, that they taught the elves the artistic way, na their artistic nature and the dwarfs their craftsman nature. Whether any of these are true or not, hard to say. But what you need to know about the Rhaegar is that if you commission one to craft some kind of item or make some kind of piece of art, it will be bar among none the greatest thing you could see. The greatest piece of craftsmanship or the greatest piece of art you could ever find. They are experts through and through at that and they are the ones that, though expensive, you would want to commission to build some of the greatest things. 
So that's it for this today. I introduced you to a whole bunch of new races. Now, most of these races are, of course, intelligent races that you're going to be visiting either in various colonies or spell jamming ships with a couple of other interesting creatures thrown in there. Giant space hamster and space mimics and such. In the next episode, I'm going to continue talking about the races and creatures you're going to find in space that are more important ones that you're going to want to know about. Before, of course, moving on to talk about more information that's out there. So, regardless though, if you have any questions, comments, anything you want to say, anything you think I left out, please leave in the comments below. Please like, share, and subscribe. Share support for the channel, the empire, the work I do. If you want to show some extra support, you can always check out my Patreon. Linked in the description below. But regardless, until the next time, I bid you farewell.